Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Hi, and welcome back to How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. This is part two of a two-part episode. So please do yourself a favor and listen to part one before diving into this one, because it'll make a lot more sense, I promise. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Now, it's always important to talk about being mentally ill. This isn't a mental illness. He's a psychopath. It doesn't take any sort of studying of serial killers to understand this guy's a psychopath. Every Anybody who's ever watched anything in true crime recognizes what this person is. But remember, everyone has that question all the time. Why is it, if you're not like the rest of us, if you're this sick in the head, how come you get, why are you mentally fit for trial? The standards are very different. Even if he was a schizophrenic, with when we could look at him and see all over the place that he's hearing voices, all you need to be mentally fit to stand trial is to have known right from wrong when you were committing the crime. You don't even need to know right from wrong now. Hmm. So, but if he's that smart, you know, why isn't he going to get help? Like, if he's, you know, if he's running this company, he's doing well, he seemed like, why isn't he saying, God, I have these urges that are ridiculous. I need to go see somebody. Because he doesn't care. There's no guilt. There's no emotion. That there's but no, it must drive him crazy, it. though. But to hold, to hold these urges back, you would think that somebody wouldn't want to walk around with all those urges all the time and not be able to just, for instance, if you're an alcoholic, you can just go buy some liquor and go drink, right? For him, it's so calculated and it takes so much time. You would think he'd want to just get rid of that, like relieve all of that by going and getting help. Well, so the serial, the psychopathic serial killers I've talked to, mm-hmm. and from what I understand just by researching them, they have this beautiful ability to delay gratification. They don't, and they don't think there's anything. If you're not, if you don't feel bad about what you do, uh, you don't feel bad about the victims. The only thing that could drive it is maybe if they are uncomfortable with these urges because they're too frequent and they can no longer delay the gratification. Yeah. But I think for him, this was a, this was kind of a lifestyle he he would have kept doing right you know i don't think he saw it it as a hindrance to himself which is so weird and it's so hard to think like a psychopath because we aren't we aren't psychopaths i just try try to figure it out you know you just try to you try to make sense of it all but they're really up the problem there is no i guess making sense of it right well, it, um, and I've been spending 20 years trying, and it's <laughs> not, I'm not getting any closer. You're going figure it out by now. Come on. There's so many different elements to every single story and the backstories and the religion with this one. And somebody could have been raised, you know, completely in a normal upbringing and have the same things and it's urges and yeah. how do you fight them? It's just like, it's so much going well, on. That's why this guy, some, you know, sometimes they're all over the board, but this guy is a pure, pretty pure psychopath. So we know a bit about those, mm-hmm. right? Um, he was evaluated by more than one psychologist. Um, they say that he's antisocial, he's impulsive, he's hostile, but he has more than average, well, higher than average intelligence. He's certainly mentally fit. So there's nothing to keep him going from trouble. But we know he's a psychopath. And let's talk about that, Missy, because one out of every hundred people you have ever met, Missy, is a psychopath. I feel like I've encountered. You know a lot more than a hundred people. <laughs> I and feel like actually, I've you know more. <laughs> Missy, Missy's that outlier that blows the statistic out of the water. Like, you know, like the bell curve, you always like, stop it over there. Like you're not throwing only, up the median. I not only like, just like run into them and casually meet them, I end up like inviting them into my lives for some reason. Um, 100% one of your ex-boyfriends has been a serial killer. And I am not I'm saying good. that yeah. flippantly. Yeah. And we're going to do a whole episode on that. But there is not one doubt in my mind that you have dated a serial killer. <laughs> the, not one doubt. But the funny thing is, like I was just saying, I keep going back to it, is that they're so hard to tell because there's so many so different elements. And that's why your yeah. job is so interesting to me because it's like, where the hell do you start? Because it can be all over the place. I do have a question, though, that I'm wondering. You said that he, um, that Israel had, what, like 10 brothers and sisters? Yeah. What are the odds of another relative of his, a sibling, becoming like, was he the only one that was feeling this? Or did he have, was it him and then like little Timmy, his, you know, 10 year old brother feeling the same way? Like, was there anybody he connected with? And there, are we, are, 
or should would people be concerned if they had 10 kids and you had for sure one ser- serial killer what's the odds of like another brother or sister of his being the same because Great of that question. upbringing was very strange you know what i mean right. specifically because of that so psychopathy is very heritable it's very it, it's it's considered you're born with it or without but it's triggered it can be triggered by events but we we can measure you know, the heritability of psychopathy has been measured over and over and over again. But he shares 50% of his genes with his brothers and sisters. So there's no reason to believe. Now, it's a constellation of genes. It's not like, oh, I got the gene. Right. So you don't usually see psychopathy popping up multiple times in one generation. It's usually a grandfather, an uncle, oh. a sister, you know, from a different mister. Like it's not, it doesn't, it's not like other, like impulsivity, mm-hmm. impulsiveness. That's that's not as inherited as psychopathy is, but it can be inherited. So you might see all of the siblings as a little bit impulsive. Psychopathy is different, but there is something going on with those parents. They are not, you know, they've got their, those genes are different to begin with. And I say genes, it could be something, I mean, obviously environment is incredibly important, but they're so far, and two of them together are so far down this weird, radical, cult-like lifestyle Mm -hmm. that I don't think they have the most basic genes involved. Like there's something going on, something drawing into them to this, there's something drawing them to hate. I imagine there's some aggression going on in there. So I thought not only would we see genetically some differences in these all of the kids, but the environment, like you say, is so triggering. The environment is so weird and nasty and hateful Mm -hmm. that you would think more of them can become criminal, but I cannot find any evidence that any of them are criminal. Mm -hmm. Um, But he was booted out of the family. He showed up to a wedding one time and started a huge fight there, but he was booted out of the family. So we don't totally know. Right. Um, And let's talk a little bit about what it looks like to be a psychopath. So you're remorseless, you don't have pity or feelings for other people. Or you don't really or animals. love. Yeah. Or animals. You're still stuck on the cat. <laughs> I'm um, still totally stuck on the cat. You're <laughs> than you. <laughs> that Missy and I have more cat inside jokes, and I hate I don't hate cats, but I don't don't spend time around them because there's they a cat looking me. at me right now in a cat tree as we're talking. <laughs> cat tree. <laughs> So they're insensitive, as you say, to the possibility of harm anyway. So they're a very unique type. I just told you one out of every hundred people you've ever met is probably a psychopath, but most of them aren't killers. Most of them aren't serial killers. Oh. And, you know, they're pro-social. So you can have those traits. You can be without remorse. You can be without guilt. You can be without pity or sensitivity to harm. You can be all of those things and still never hurt somebody. Well, and the generational can- thing, too, is interesting what you said. You know, I could, I could just see that. Maybe it was like, you know, a grandfather back and then all of a sudden it just, I don't know. I, there's something going there's, on with this family, but besi- like there's the environmental something, yeah. but we, we know to be a pure psychopath, you have genetics involved. There's, there's a whole cluster. It's really hard to disentangle when it's all, here's a crazy environment that's not well understood. It's not like, okay, he came up from a physically abusive environment. We can talk about what we know research wise. This is an unusual cult-like hate-driven, uh, uh, living out in the wilderness without basic necessities, right. there's a lot happening. And then they're calling it all, you know, putting it all under the cloak of God. Right. So there's a lot going on. Um, in the documentary entitled The Method of a Serial Killer, I found some of the clips to be incredibly telling about what kind of killer he he is. So, He comes across as a typical cold psychopath. He's affable. He's unremarkable. He's naturally very unaffected when he describes the murders. It's like he's talking to you about going and getting a cup of coffee without killing somebody. And he laughs. He finds all of it so funny. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, they probably weren't expecting me in their house that night. Like, Like, they were a little surprised. It's Can I have a double shot of espresso with, like, two bodies on the side? Right. I mean... With two bodies on... He's, uh, it's it's unnerving to see it, but if you didn't know he was killing people, you'd never know he was killing people. Wow. Because he's just like joking <clears throat> and he's, ta- everything's so, like, he's like, oh yeah, I forgot. Then she started doing this and he starts laughing. And it's like you're talking to, you know, a friend. He talks about one point, he's like, oh yeah, I, I, you know, I, I got into to, to football because this other guy really hated the Packers. And it's just like talking to a normal person. Right. 
But then the words, the actual words that come out of his mouth are so frightening. Um, He said during this interview, I have always known, he said, everybody who's ever met me, known me, has never really known me. I am two different people. He's not describing multiple personality disorder. I think he's describing what we see in the evolution of a psychopath. When they are young, they don't know to hide that they don't give a shit, Mm -hmm. that they don't care if their little sister's crying or if their mom is upset or if what they do is disruptive. They don't care if they've poked the eye out of their guppies. They don't care. Then they don't know that we don't care. Right. So eventually, it's one of the reasons I study psychopathy in children, because you got to talk to them before they know they're not like the others. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they learn the language. They learn to say the right things. They learn to hide it. They learn to hide it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They learn to hide their sickness. And he's describing it so succinctly. I've never heard someone describe it this way. He's like, I am two different people. I realized I was not like you. So I learned to fake being like you. And the way I tell people to think of this is like, okay, so we have five senses. So when everyone around you, but what if everyone around you had six? Mm -hmm. So when they're talking about taste and smell, we all know what that is. But what if they start talking about this other sense that you don't have? And And if you tell them you don't have it, they freak out. You start mimicking the words they use to describe that sense. So if if somebody has never been able to see in their entire lives, it would be really hard to tell them what sight is. Right. Like, how do you tell them what seeing something is? You can say hearing, but if you've never seen anything in your life, you don't know what that means mm-hmm. to see something. Right. That is what the psychopaths experience when people describe guilt uh, empathy for another person. It's a They're foreign like, emotion to them. It's a it's foreign emotion that foreign. they have to fake. They have to fake yeah. it. Yeah. They fake it until but, they make okay. it. And they fake it until they make it. Literally in society. Mm-hmm. They fake their way into society of this like normal person, but they're faking it the whole time because the real them is laughing at at, you know, animal killing videos in the dark. I mean, yeah. and that's when they're yep. happy. And that's when they're happy. So if they are interested in other things like making money or mm-hmm. I always say, you know, running companies or doing really high risk things to get their thrill, great. They go on to live on like that. You, it's not, you know, I feel bad for their wife and kids if they're even able to manage to keep a wife and kids. Uh, do they love their children? He's a good dad. You hear this a lot. They don't think of their children. They do not love them like we do, mm-hmm. but they also are never going to have an urge to kill them. They're just kind of like, oh, that's a bit of an extension. It's a tool for me. It's an extension. It, you know, probably garners a lot of support for him from, you know, girlfriends and employees. There's something there. There's some sort of attachment to the child, but it's not what you and I think of um, in terms of being attached to children. Uh He said during his interview, he said, I will give you more information if you can promise me anonymity. I don't want people to know that I am this killer. I don't want them to, I don't want my daughter to grow up like that. I mean, I I don't necessarily want to put my mom in, in the grave with a heart attack. So he starts to come across like he cares. And then later on, it's kind of revealed, it's not. I don't believe he gives a shit if his daughter knows he's a killer or not, or has to live under that label. I think it's because he doesn't want to go down as a failure. But he actually he's got, a failed but he got serial caught. killer. Yeah, but he actually got caught. Bingo. Interesting. So they learn to say words that they think are going to impact us non-psychopathic people. Right. Oh, you don't want your daughter to feel that way. Uh-uh. uh-uh. I They're see. so good They're at so it. smart that they know how to play on the, the, the sense that we don't, the, the sixth sense you were talking about or whatever that we don't have mm-hmm. of his. Mm. They see our vulnerability, but they don't, that doesn't exist in that. Doesn't. They have no clue. They have no clue what we're talking about. Mm. Before I dive into what can be done, Missy, are there any questions about the story that... I mean, let's see. No, I don't think so. I mean, right now, while we're in Anchorage, he's running this business. He, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the girl, the like girl 10. she's 10. He's got the dead girl in the shed in the back. He's mm-hmm. sewing eyes open. He's taking pictures. He's getting money. Um, did he spend too much money on his uh, cruise? Is that why he needed more money? Because I'm curious if he ran a successful business. Why is he stealing money from this, this poor girl or, or trying to get money, you know, put yeah. into her account? What happens next? So now I don't know. Now I, so now now I just know there's a cold, dead body in his shed that looks like a doll. 
I forgot to tell you what happens next. <laughs> yeah. You ready? I'm ready. He chops her up. What? He dismembers her. No. He takes her fishing. He goes what? ice fishing. He, when you ice fish, you know, we all know this from grumpy old men. This is the first time I'd ever seen ice fishing in my entire life. I'm like, y'all go, choose to go out onto that ice and in a hut and dig a hole. And, you know, you, you dig a hole into the ice and you put your fishing pole or in his case, your bodies. Oh. So he threw, he, he, he put his dismembered victim into the hole in the ice where it's going to be preserved and, but no one's going to find it. And then guess what he did, Missy? What? He fished. Like legitimately fished. I'm not the fish. And guess what he did? Body. What? Took the fish he home. He brought the fish home. No, he did not. No, he did not. <laughs> yes. And he ate them. Oh. So while the other bodies of this horrifying serial killer were never recovered, Samantha Koenig's body was. The deep, the extremely cold weather deep divers from the FBI went down into that hole and she was there. No. She was absolutely there. And he described it as the, 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 the investigator was like, it was so emotional because while this is a crime scene and it's going to be preserved and we have a killer, I am looking at somebody's child and I'm going to bring her home. Like, I'm going to get this body out of here. You know, so it's like, it's evidence and it's to convict him, but she got brought home. Oh, wow. I'm surprised yeah. that there didn't, the ant, the wildlife didn't get to her at first, you know? Well, I'm imagining in those freezing, freezing Alaska lakes. So he says, he's like, I went and found a deep lake and I just, you know, I, I imagine there's something to do with the temperature. Yeah. And what are, what are the predators? Maybe the fish there aren't, they don't, maybe they don't prey upon, you know, dead flesh. Of, I don't know what, or maybe they were securely wrapped in bags. Those are details I don't have. Yeah, but it's good to know that her family had closure finally, something, yeah. you know, her poor, if you had to look at some kind of positive note to any of it. So I would love to get in front of this guy and ask a few questions. Yeah, love it. yeah, you should, you should try. I should try except for one really annoying, horrifying, frustrating detail. So he has to be in control of everything. Mm -hmm. He So he had one of his demands, he wanted to get the death penalty. He wanted it to be quick. They used this all as leverage to get more information out of him. He said he wanted cigars and snicker bars at first, but then he's like, I want anonymity. I want the death penalty. And somebody leaked the information to the press. So now his name is out there. And then he just, his whole demeanor changes. He starts clamming up because now he is going to go down as a failed psychopath. He He's lost a little bit of control. He likes the control. Um, so he starts clamming up a bit. He's not giving people information, but he's still needs control. So he kills himself. Oh, to the bitter end. There's so many unanswered questions. There's so many victims out there still who haven't been found. Yeah. And he, they, the, all that information died with him. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm displeased. How did he kill himself what? in jail? He, he slit his, oh. he did it very, very well. He slit his wrists and then he hung himself. And one of the, on this documentary, one of the, um, I think this guy was a former PR for Anchorage Police. He said, well, think about it. Of course, the guy's going to succeed in killing himself. He's an expert at killing human bodies. Yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, the other victims, you know, we don't have that information, but this earth is better off without that guy. This earth is better off without the guy. The guy is not going to go on to do good things, no, right? No, no. He's not going to go on to be, but you know what he is, Missy? What? what? He's someone for us to study. Yes. Yeah. So I was a little... Selfishly, I want more information, but my overarching feeling is like, that's fucked up that these, sorry about that language. Um, it's really messed up that all those answers are gone. So these victims, he he swears he had 11 victims. He drew 11 skulls on his suicide note. Suicide notice had nothing interesting in it. It was like like serial killer poetry, somebody called it, it was stupid. Um, but okay, so fine. He's still in charge. He ultimately gets to still have full control. He has. He doesn't care. He has no empathy. He doesn't give you know a shit about keeping the information with him. So he he wins in some ways. He wins. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. get to go down as the notorious unsolved, uh, serial, you know, uncaught, unapprehended, mysterious serial killer he wants to be. But mm -hmm. he still got the last word. Mm -hmm. He played his final card. So what do we do about it? What do you do if 
there is an Israel Keys in your parenting orbit. And most of us have spent so much freaking time trying to understand psychopathy because it is probably the most unusual personality set of traits that we have. I mean, of course, there's people with, you know, schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder that like look very biologically different and ill, but a psychopath hides among us. They they act like us. It's almost like an alien who has taken on a human form. Yeah, it's men in black. Uh, I'm really upset I haven't thought of that. I'm going to start every episode with aliens who've taken on human forms. 100%. I think of men in black, everybody, you know, you would have no idea. They're running the the liquor store, right? You don't know. You have no idea. So in children, it manifests as they kind of just lump it up to callous and unemotional traits. So it's the, it's all the same stuff. It's the, you know, lack of remorse, lack of empathy, lack of concern about one's performance on important activities, lack of emotional expression. They have very shallow affect. They have some emotions, not, not guilt and remorse, empathy, all, pity and all that. They do have some other emotions, but it's shallow. It's blunted. So well, there's not blunted. like love though. Like as, as far as like a parent goes, do they Mm-mm. seek that attention and that love from their parent? They might Is seek that- the attention. Because it's not it seems like even with him, with Israel, the mom, again, controlling sleep outside, it makes you feel like animalistic. You know what I mean? Like, go outside. You don't have to, you don't even get to sleep inside. It seems like For that's somebody- why he would kill. That would be one of the rage factors, right? I'm wondering if, and most kids, like, can you detect it if, if a kid is constantly like, mom, I love you. I love you. I, I love you. Mommy, do you love me? Like, is that one of the things or do they not care? They don't care. They you don't, don't care see who that in psychopaths. Them. They mm-hmm. don't care who loves They them. need their needs met. And if they need attention, they might seek attention. But usually the relationships are transactional. Mm-hmm. If they're being good or kind, it's because they want something from their parent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's not a... Kind of sounds like not, my teenager, by the way. Yeah, they're very much like... <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like every teenager I know. <laughs> well, I think every teenager goes through a pseudo-psychopathic... <laughs> yeah. Transactional. Yeah. <laughs> Teenagers are little, oh. like, fake psychopaths. Right. <laughs> They really are. They really are. Yeah. So in, okay, but he showed himself, right? He's like, he wasn't rageful. He wasn't angry. He just loved killing things. Mm. He loved killing. And he showed that he was different from everyone else really early on. So what do you do if you see that? I want to take a moment to tell all of you about this amazing new service called FrameBridge. FrameBridge makes it easier and more affordable than ever to frame your favorite things without ever leaving your house. If you're anything like me, you have stacks of photos that you've been meaning to frame, but the idea of picking the frame and figuring out where to put them is just too overwhelming. With this service, you can add a gallery wall to your home office or even just plan out a few custom gifts for your friends. From art prints and posters to the priceless photos you've forgotten about on your phone, you can FrameBridge just about anything. Here's how it works. You go to FrameBridge.com and upload your photo. Then you preview your item online in dozens of frame styles and gallery wall layouts. You can either choose your favorite frame or get free recommendations from their designers. Then the experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your photo and deliver your finished piece directly to your door. If you happen to have a physical piece that you'd like to frame, FrameBridge will send you special packaging to safely mail your items for custom framing. Instead of the hundreds you'd pay at a typical framing store, FrameBridge frames start at $39 and shipping is always free. Plus, my listeners will get 15% off their first order at FrameBridge.com when they use my code HOWNOT. And if you happen to be in New York City, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Philadelphia, Boston, or Chicago, you can stop by a FrameBridge store to work with one of their designers in person. Get started today. To frame your photos or send someone the perfect gift, go to FrameBridge.com and use promo code HOWNOT to save an additional 15% off your order. Go to FrameBridge.com, promo code HOWNOT. That's FrameBridge.com, promo code HOWNOT. We spend so much time trying to understand what they were, and then now people are understanding, well, what can we do about it? Right. So there's a very strong genetic underpinning to psychopathy. There's also biology we can see. You're never going to teach a psychopath to have those 
emotional feelings we're talking about where they truly love, care, regret, all of that, because that lives in the amygdala. And their amygdalas are functionally... They're what? And they're, they're amygdala? A, amygdala. And amygdala is a brain structure. <laughs> Excuse me. Don't talk to me in that pornographic way. <laughs> the campus. Touch my amygdala. <laughs> well, you have to get it deep and touch their amygdalas because there's no activity. You've got to like pro, prod, oh my God. prod it and see if you can get like something. <laughs> get something going in there because... It's just structurally and functionally different from psychopaths. So it lives in the limbic system and it is wh- there where these emotions live. That, you know, what makes us human, that mm-hmm. feeling of caring for another, being able to empathize with what another human's going for or going through and to feel bad mm-hmm. if you've hurt somebody or an animal. We see a difference in there. So you're not going to teach it. You, you can teach them the words and how yeah. to fake it, but you're not going to teach them how to feel it. But what if you like, I was just thinking what you said about the orbit, it was a really good word that you used because it, you, it is everybody's in their like parental orbits of these people that come in and out with school and everything like that. What if you have a, you know, your friend, your son's friend over, or daughter's friend over, and they're exhibiting, I mean, specifically you, they're exhibiting this person is exhibiting, you know, psychopathic tendencies. I and mean, we're talking, talking, Every, they match every single, you know, color that you're looking for to diagnose this. Do you go and tell the parents? And what if you do and the parents don't do anything? And you know that well, this kid is going to seriously be a serial killer in 10 years. Yes, to all of that. <laughs> I, you, and you then do. think about me. I'm unequipped with this. I might not even know that I can't diagnose them. So there could be so, some little baby serial killers everywhere. And we don't, I don't, I'm not equipped to know all the things that you know. And I don't, I want to say something. Hey, your kid's like kill, trying to kill my cat. Your kid's chasing my cat with an ax, like those kinds of things. But you don't go serial killer route. Right. I'm like, your kid's disturbed and we need to have a conversation, but we're not. So it's really like they could be being raised everywhere. And we just don't, we're not equipped. Maybe that's why everybody needs to be listening to your show. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. That's why I wanted to do this show. Because first of all, I have been faced years ago with a situation where I could see psychopathic traits in this child who didn't know how to hide it yet. You can't go up to a parent and be like, I think you're raising a psychopath because they think serial killer. Yeah. Psychopaths, most of them do not become serial killers. So I think what for me now, I've abandoned this idea of shit, I need to tell you. It's we need the information out there that A, psychopaths are not all serial killers. Um, in fact, usually they're surgeons, um, they're running companies. I've, I've said this many, many times. And B, there is something you can do about it. That environment where Israel lived, where Keys lived, is perfect to make him become an antisocial psychopath. He's always going to be psychopathic, but he, maybe he would have been a pro-social psychopath if not but for his environment. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I generally don't believe that parents, schools, um, they're not, it's my goal in life to get this out there and hopefully people listen to it and it's destigmatized in, a, in such a way that you can recognize some callous and unemotional traits in your child and do something about it mm-hmm. and not be like, oh, it's Ted Bundy, because it's not. Right. It's not Ted Bundy. It is, um, you know, and, and to ease your mind, you're, you don't have a psychopath growing in oh. your house. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good to know. I, I, if, I, if it was one of my good friends, I'd mention it. But there are things you can do. Like, let's say you did have a child who was really cruel to their pets, did not care at all, like laughed if you got hurt, laughed if his siblings got hurt, um, generally did not was so self-serving and unaware of other people's, you know, and I'm not talking that on the autism spectrum. I'm talking this person is is going after his or her own goals, even if it demolishes another person and they get, they feel nothing about that. If you mm-hmm. see that, let's talk about what you can do. So genes and environment interact. Yes, they might have, you know, genes leading to this lack of remorse, skill, empathy, but in children, you can actually, you can, fix this outcome. So for people with psychopathy, it doesn't mean they can't become normal and pro-social. No, they're never going to feel empathy and guilt and remorse. I always, those are the hallmarks. So they're never going to feel it like you and I do, but they can learn that those are important things to try to recognize what they should be doing to lead productive lives. They often have difficulties in the beginning with information processing streams, and we can work on that. So again, they're never going to be deep emotional people, but we can get them to be interested in behaving correctly and to reading cues from you. So 
there's a researcher named Baskin Summers, and this researcher calls it an, an exaggerated, this problem with information processing is an exaggerated attention bottleneck. The, the psychopaths have a difficulty filtering information when it first comes in. So in essence, people's psychopathy becomes so focused on one part, one goal, one, one thing that they are so interested in that their brain stops processing the other information or processes it just too slowly to inform the next step. In this article, they talk about Robert Durst. He was a serial killer. He was that killer. He killed his best friend. He killed his wife. He had, he walked into a store wanting a hoagie sandwich. He had $30,000 in his pocket. He was on the run for murder, but he steals it because he just wanted that sandwich and he didn't, he didn't process the information quickly enough to realize I can't be stealing a sandwich because if I steal a sandwich, I might get caught. If I get caught, I'm going down. Hmm. Like the, it's that kind of myopic single mind focus. Psychopaths, when you look at them in children, they can be like that and you can undo that. Here's how. The same researcher, Baskin Summers, developed a task to help people address these attention abnormalities. They developed a video game that would target the problematic information processing. So for psychopathy, and they did it for antisocial personality disorder as well, but that's a different episode. For psychopathy, the games help the person in, often a kid in this case, they can be adults or kids, they integrate the information they need to succeed at, succeed at the game. So gives them the information the brain needs so that they win that goal, uh -huh. but at the same time forces them to focus on details of the face or a, a, of a person that is placed in the background. So in order to truly win, you can't just get the, the work on the video game a task, you have to also be able to respond to cues from a face in the right, background. Right. So it's teaching them, yeah, to to recognize um cue background cues at any given moment. So to me, this seems similar to some of the therapies we use to teach uh, children who are on the autism spectrum to recognize cues, social cues in other people. Uh, very wildly different people we're talking about. A psychopath or somebody uh, with autism spectrum disorder on this has nothing to do with psychopathy, but both of them fail to understand the cues of another person. Right. So it's kind of interesting. And the people who received that training, they not only improved um, in the game, but the, the related experimental tasks. The preliminary data showed that even inmates with psychopathy who received this training had fewer disciplinary problems, and they they just had much better outcomes. So it's in its infancy, but it's we are learning that you can train them. They're not they're not born with that interest to care about what somebody else looks like or is feeling, but you can train them to recognize it and behave in that parameter. Mm -hmm. So these games serve as kind of a primer for other therapies. We and this is what Baskin says. She's like it's teaching them self regulation. Mm -hmm. So. I have this goal, I want this thrill, but I need to pay attention to the world around me. Like right. it matters. If my goal is to go skydiving or base jumping, it matters how that affects people around me. Right, or if, if I, I wanna want, kill. If I wanna kill. I wanna go skydiving, base jumping, or kill. Right, so hopefully they pull away from killing because they have been trained that that matters. Like what you do to somebody else matters. I know you don't feel it, but we're gonna teach you to recognize it and have it matter. But you have to so, want that, they have to want it. You know what I mean? Right, they have to want yeah. it. And there are, and we'll talk about this, there are places that are all reward-based. I've talked about Mendota several times, but there's another place I'm gonna bring up today where they train, they actually will put these, well, I'll get to it. The people who spend all of the time with the children who end up basically you know, for lack of a better term, in some cases, raising them are trained in this to teach, to teach the kids to, to make it such a part of their regular lives that they want to behave. It's all reward based. They realize that they can do all of their weird stuff that they want to do, whatever their goal is, and not need to kill people oh. and not need to hurt people. So what she says is we need to correct the lens through which they are seeing the world, and then they can engage in more traditional therapies. Mm -hmm. So you know, so instead of somebody like getting hooked on drugs and going to like a rehabilitation, they would get like somebody would know somebody would notice these things with this child. They get let's say diagnosed, if you will, not a drug addict, but you know, a psychopath, well, right? And then exactly. they get sent to an institution like this where they can well, maybe cure or like help them through this. I guess not cure, right? Because it can never be fixed, cure. but it can help them but reprogram tools, them. tools. Yeah, give them tools to reprogram. Reprogramming them, just like is that the yeah, future? Yeah. You think of this? Yeah. 
Yeah. Just like an, uh, somebody with autism spectrum disorder doesn't naturally see cues from people. They can be trained to see the cues. Mm. Psychopathy, they're never going to feel it, but they can be trained to respond. Mm. So it starts with training the parents. And I love that. So again, you have to be willing to admit that your child has callous and unemotional traits. Then you go into this behavioral parent training. It's, it's, they improve. Once they once the the people in their orbit are doing this, the children improve. Mm. And based on this, there have been other studies. So there's a, a kind of therapy that was developed by scientists at the University of New South Wales in Australia. And it's based on this idea that if you can get the child to start processing the information differently, yes, they're goal-driven and they don't really care about how you feel, but if you can get them to start recognizing and make it relevant and important to them. But like, as you said, they have to care. Yeah. So it's called parent-child interaction therapy. And it's the, the argument, it's better to address the needs of young children with the elevated callous and unemotional traits. So in this 21 session modified version, uh, the, the, the therapist teaches parents how to emphasize positive reinforcement to change a, change a child's behavior. I'm not talking like, oh, you get a star for reading a book. Right. It's very specific. Like these therapies are highly tailored, mm-hmm. and it, but it teaches them how to be warmer and more responsive in their parenting and how to coach their children to pay attention to other children's emotions. Uh-huh. You're not going to make them care, but you motivate them to pay attention somehow that becomes part of their goal. Like, I am much more likely to get my uh, my Xbox, my bike, iPad time, if I can show that I recognize this emotion in another child. Mm-hmm. It makes it part of the little psychopath's goal right. is to be able to recognize mm-hmm. the emotions of another person. And it's working. And in, oh, like, for example, there's this a, a trial where they used kids from three to nine years old, and they saw very highly significant reductions in these callous and unemotional traits and in conduct disorder and increases in empathy, at least as much as they could measure. We don't know if it's a real empathy, but the children were acting far more empathetic hmm. than they were before the start of treatment. It's three months. It must not end there. It has to be. It takes a lot longer. That's not like a one shot thing. But Children who don't even know we're looking for them to be more empathetic during this this kind of highly tailored treatment, they started acting more mm-hmm. empathetic. So it gets a little more complicated once it's a teenager, but we do have programs. So I've talked about Mendota, which is a juvenile de- uh, treatment center where they take the worst of the worst of the boys. And it's all like these people are so highly trained. It's, it was developed by two psychologists. It's all complete positive reinforcement. And those kids don't recidivate. In fact, they end up being some of the best once they're released of all of the post criminals, whereas if they don't get that treatment, even though they were originally the worst of the criminals, mm-hmm. there's there's another place called Boys Town. And I just learned about this one. I had I didn't know much. I'd heard of it, but I didn't know much about it. It's a residential campus in Nebraska and Omaha. And they have satellite programs in nine sites around the country. It's I had heard about the other programs. I didn't realize it was all the same thing, but it's brilliant. There, the children and teens with a variety of behavioral, psychological, emotional, family problems, they live in homes where trained married couples known as family teachers. So this becomes their home. Mm -hmm. And it's completely focused on these youth at risk for psychopathy. And it shows the the program's working. These kids are coming out with far fewer callous and unemotional traits and more it's not real empathy, but it's they're behaving empathetically. It has now become important to them to try to act empathetically. And that's what you need. Mm. That's what you need. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's the way to think about it is that it's a process of training and treatment. It's a process of teaching these children who were born this way and, and maybe even triggered more by their environment how to see the world a little differently than they do and why that will benefit them. And, it has to be positive. They this particular group of kids, when kids respond, like these kids respond so poorly to negative parenting. Like if with consequences don't work on them and it makes them worse. Mm-hmm. So if you have a child who's like this, where where punishments just don't even matter to them, it's really hard as a parent. You know, I I couldn't do it unless I was trained in this, but you shift everything to completely positive. These programs have completely positive reward systems coupled with this training and how to teach these children 
that being acting empathetic and paying attention to other children's needs and other humans needs actually benefits them and it's working have they ever put a uh like a serial killer through these programs before but they would probably just fake it they would probably fake it huh <laughs> spit my water out here let's put a serial killer in with all these kids not the kids but i mean through the yeah. teachings yeah through the teachings i don't know I don't know. They probably if would just fake tried. it. They're so used to faking it by then. You know what I mean? That's why it's important to get them before they learn how. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But isn't that interesting Very. that you can take somebody who is biologically unequipped to feel what makes us human, that's caring about each other and not hurting each other and 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 feeling guilty for what we do wrong and really truly depth of emotion. That's what makes us different from a lizard. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yes. But to, to, to have honed in on particular treatment programs that can circumvent that problem and still and get that kid off of a trajectory that could lead to serial killing or money laundering or Ponzi scheming. Right. Into bank robbing. Bank robbing into something that, you know, they're still going to be goal driven and, you know, not super interested in, in damaging. But they now benefit and recognize uh, it's better for me to recognize and appreciate what I'm doing yeah. to somebody else. Yeah. This well, is what their face looks like. I said this on another podcast. If you like, if you show a psychopath a picture of, they can't recognize. Okay, I wish the listeners could see the cat you just put in the video frame. Cats are a little psychopathic. Um, they really they, are. If you show a psychopathic killer a, a face of somebody with fear, because most of them don't have tr- like fear. They don't have, they're not scared. And this guy said, I don't know what that emotion is, but it's exactly what the face someone makes right before I stab them. Oh. Mm-hmm. So if you can teach the little guy before he becomes that guy, yes. that that face is an important face to pay attention to, and you don't want to do whatever you're doing that's making that guy make that face. That's the goal. That is the goal. It's good to know that they have places out there working on this. You know what I mean? And they've they've made such strides, it sounds like. You know, it's really yeah. affecting a lot of people. And it's kind of nice to know, like, people come on podcasts or they go on TV and they have all these complaints, right? It's always like, oh, we don't want to hear your problems. We want to hear solutions. This is actually a real solution that's coming our way. I had no idea. I mean, instead of going to, like I said, somebody that's, you know, addicted to whether it's alcohol or drugs or any other form, you know, a, a, an addiction, instead of going to Serenity in Malibu, they might be going to, you know... <laughs> For people totally. that they see, <laughs> they see, you know, psychopathic tendencies, they might be going to somewhere else, you know, that's specifically for them. But there's help, there's treatment. You're not alone. You're not crazy. You're not just like lost it. You don't have mm-hmm. to go kill. And it's just, it's nice to know that they're they're working on these things for people like that. I mean, Missy, I'm trying. Like I, you Come know, on, my speed it up, speed it up. I, I'm on. I've been on other <laughs> shows. I've had other podcasts, and I'm like, this is what's missing out there. Is that we're not. I say it all the time. Like I just want this. I don't care if it's me doing it. I don't care if it's someone else doing it, but you, I just want it out there. Yeah. You know? like yeah. I, I it is. It is out there. It's out there right now. So Missy, you, I think would be an expert on a subject I've covered before, but it's a subject that I'm going to cover again and again, because it is such a pervasive problem. It affects 10% of our children and no one talks about it. It's called teen domestic violence. Um, or teen dating violence. And you have quite a bit of information on that. I definitely think I could consider myself an expert, maybe a double expert by now. Um, Yeah, there are so many different aspects to it. And I have so many questions for you looking back on this. I mean, I've been through so much and so many stories that we can talk about, um, maybe, you know, in in another podcast. Um, But I definitely looking back on it now have questions that I've never asked you being my one of my best friends in seventh grade, um, that I would love to ask you. And that I think other people out there should know about and be able to recognize things that I didn't recognize when I was a teen. And I fell for a lot of things. And I wasn't completely stupid. You know what I mean? I was looking for things. But there were some things that I could not figure out on my own. And it would be so nice to have a podcast out there to help guide not only um, kids that are listening to it, but the parents listening to it so they can have things to look out for. Missy, it's going to be so important. And it's important for you. Were, I was there. I was there for all mm-hmm. of them. And you, Missy has had, and just as a little bit of a teaser, Missy has had, um, you know, just dating like the rest of us, but almost by some weird coincidence that we're going to try to get to the bottom of some of these guys who looked like everyone else 
have been attempted murderers, have been f- tried to frame other people for murder. Number of them have died. And not in ways that we could have seen. Manipulative, snakes in the grass. And I was there for all of that. Our perspective now as adults and as you said, someone who's now looking into that type of crime, mm-hmm. it's going to be super important because we talk about some crimes that are so rare. Why aren't we talking about something that could potentially... I, would you not say you're lucky to be alive in a lot of different... Oh, like, 100%. Some, 100%. Some can't, shit even, we did. No, can't, even, can't even believe it. But what's interesting is that you were there for most of this. And so mm-hmm. you didn't even, couldn't even, t- not knowing what you were going to get into, nope. obviously we were teenagers, but could not have known. It's interting now to look back on it and mm-hmm. the fact that you were there. And these people were, they're almost like experts in what they do, like what we're talking about today. But you don't even, I don't even think they knew they were experts at what they were doing. But they were so good. They were good. And they were young. Mm-hmm. They were young. Mm-hmm. They And they had honed their craft with maybe not even knowing they'd honed their craft. Yep. And, you know, it was just living, watching you live through it and how clever you were and how crafty. But it put you in such danger in that if the parents, just this one episode I did, I had more people calling me after that being like, well, how do we know? How do we know? How mm-hmm. do we know? You know, and we don't know a lot about our teens dating life. But, and you're, you had very hands-on I mean, of course, your parents worked, but yeah. they weren't, as far as absent parents, they were there. I knew them very well. We were always at your house. The The generation was a little different. Yeah, and there wasn't we no internet more, I, either. There wasn't the internet, no. you know, there, which no. is actually a little bit more concerning because now you, I don't know, it was, you, you, it's more concerning in the fact that you just don't want pe- people on, online, you actually meet them in person. So I was, yeah. that's even more shocking to me that there wasn't more carnage, if you will, or hurt, or that I wasn't hurt physically more. Than I already was because I had to actually physically, in, you know, encounter these people. I wasn't just on um, the computer hiding and, you know, oh, you hiding. look cute. It was literally like, you look cute. Here, come on, come over. Let's hang out. You know, your mom, your parents met these guys. Yeah. I met them. My mom met them. Mm-hmm. Like these were guys that who were who very easily there could have been a murder. There's sure I'm sure there have been murders. I'm, I'm sure some of them have gone on to murder. Mm-hmm. Um, and they it's not like you were dating people who just got out of, you know, the local detention center. Right. These were people among us. So we will do a whole episode. You have a very unique perspective on that. You had the unlucky misfortune of they are interested in you. Yeah. And that's one thing that we'll talk about. There is something about you and I think it's kind of your adventurous spirit that attracts them because they're sensation seekers. Yeah. So it's something and so about am I. you. And so am I. Yep. And I've gone to a couple psychics now and they say that I'm an empath. You don't need a psychic for that. So you have to be careful who you allow into your orbit, Missy. It's been very difficult. But even last night, look at even you know, all the people that I've listed, the six people that are close, you know, that I have out where I live now are all they can suck things out of me. You know what I mean? So it's like I have yeah. to not to be like all about me or whatever, but I'm just saying. But you that, know what? It'll be a good message in the podcast. Even yeah, it's we not, have to you know, learn it's how like, to, I, I don't want to like, we have to learn how to hone that. You know what I mean? So we yeah. to protect yourself, bubble wrap yourself. If you're an empath, if yeah. vampires look for you for their energy, if you're a grounded, if you're their grounder, how do you bubble wrap yourself? How do you recognize the predator? Well, and how do we, how do we tell other parents out there to, and their teenagers, it could be ma- male or female to recognize if they're an empath because nobody Perfect. ever told me you are too nice. Why do you give, I tell the girls this, I have teenage girls, I'm driving around in my car, I tell Amanda everything. She's like, mm-hmm. she seems, I feel like she's equipped now. I feel like, I feel like she can soar, you know? But mm-hmm. I say to them, listen, you guys, I always gave everybody 100%. Everybody gets a chance, Allison said. Everybody got the Everybody gets the a doubt. chance, I give 100%. And if you take away like 10%, 10%, 10%, if you get down below 50, I cut you off. That's what I used to say. And I used to be proud of saying that. I'm like, why? I'm me. I'm a great person. They should be earning a percentage from me, not me yep. giving them automatically 100%. So yep. I had to tell the teenage girls this. And they were like, oh, man, I was like, oh, my God, Bob, that's like so embarrassing. But when I told her when she was alone, she was getting it. She got it. And her friend was like, really? What do you mean? Wait, what do you mean? She had questions, too, about it. So I think if we can maybe help with the podcast, too, of like how you can recognize if your kids are potential victims, right? Yeah, yes. Arm them because you can't fix everyone out them. You can't fix everyone out there. You can only bubble wrap them. We have to train them to look out for these things, you know, give them the skills. Not just, oh, we're going to have so much fun. I mean, it's going to be a two parter. It's going to be a two parter for sure. It's going to be a maybe a three parter. I mean, I gave you a lot to think about though, Breach, to to figure out how. And again, 
you are much more likely to have the problem of your child being physically abused or potentially killed by her boyfriend than you are to running into a serial killer. But if my parents looked at him and said, or I was equipped with that information that hopefully you can give everybody, I would know, you know, hey, wait, he's showing these signs or hey, my daughter's dating somebody that's like this. You know what I mean? Yep. No, no, right on. That's okay, the- let's save the world one podcast at a time. <laughs> No, but you're absolutely right, Missy. And I'm so glad you approached me because I that episode was really haunting to me. And when you're like, hey, 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 why didn't you have me on for that? I'm like, I didn't even think about it. Like, also, it's private. Yeah. But the fact that you're willing to share the story and be kind of, yeah, you know, the, the cautionary tale so that people can help their children. Yeah, that's putting myself you know, out shit. there for sure. I remember too before, uh, oh, stalked. Remember we wanted to do mm-hmm. because I was basically stalked. And so- yeah. <laughs> And then At the I time, would, we were trepid. There was some trepidation around it because it was still a little too recent. It was too. I, I couldn't do it then. It but was, now I think it I'm was ready too recent. To do it, so it's been mm-hmm. years now. Oh so. my god! Well, you, by the way, that's a whole episode in and of itself. Yeah. Like we. Okay. Oh my god! Okay. And don't even get me started on meds. Like I'm a whole episode in itself right there. <laughs> oh my! Missy god. just needs her own podcast. I'm just not going to talk. But I, you're I'm just going to go. Expert. I'm not an expert in anything except for just life. I think. <laughs> so. If you can try to say that like a lot of psychopaths, sociopaths, whatever, they look for somebody like me because I want to help, 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 help. It's yeah, kind of like a tool. silent. Yeah. Silence of the lambs. Look at these pretty little, you know, puppies yeah. come in my van. Precious. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I won't even just get in the van. I'll say, I'll pick all of them and I will adopt all of them out and I will, you know, blah, blah, I'll pay yeah. for them. And I go to that yeah. tenth degree, you know? Yeah. Do you need me to wash your van? Yeah. <laughs> My family has a running joke that if like, oh, did you need to move? I'll be right there. Like, right. Missy, you do. You do this. Mm-hmm. We're going to get you to stop. I know. Missy, thank you. This has been incredible. We are going to, I'm going to take you up on that offer. No give backs. You have to promise that you will show up because this, these are important things. And listen, somebody should benefit from the crazy shit that went down. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This has been great. And as always, love you and love what you're doing and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, that was another episode of How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and we will see you next time. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N T R A S K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818 392 4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. 